It's been almost two months since I've been out here being productive on Ben and Amanda's shop. And apparently they still love me because they haven't locked me out. And part of the reason for that is because Ben's been doing his own electrical work. And this is new to Ben, the high voltage stuff. He is working his way forward carefully and meticulously and it looks great. And he can only work really a few hours a day or less because he does have a full-time job for which we're all grateful, right? I mean, there's nothing better than a good son-in-law who actually works. But here we are, the weather's a little better and I can't put it off any longer. So I'm gonna jump on the outside of this. I'm gonna bring in secret weapon Dave to help me sort of push forward on this lap siding. And today I'm just sort of staging, rolling out, getting acquainted with my new little table saw and gonna put up some corner bats, some of the trim, so we can infill with the siding without having to sort of, you know, switch processes as we go, but rather concentrate on one process at a time which is almost always better. So I've been putting the corner bats on the outside of this. I didn't film it because it was just not worth the filming really. But I'll point out a couple of things. I had to use full inch and a half, inch and three eighths actually on this stuff material because the, the existing house has a thicker corner bat so there's more relief between the outside corner of the lap siding and the face of the board. And I wanted to match. So that'll make the caulking easier. It's just garden variety carpentry, cutting these things around here and letting them hang down the right distance and fitting it against the roof. It's just work. But I use screws on it and that's a little silly. I mean, you don't need to. The right nail that penetrates will hold it beautifully because it's held in by the siding on each side. It's caulked, it's bulletproof. But the screws introduced an element of forgiveness. I'm working by myself and I didn't want to waste one stick because it's very expensive. This stuff is about I think probably 37 or 40 bucks per stick. So I didn't want to waste any. I had exactly the right amount, so I screwed it together, and uh, it's just a little peace of mind. They're an exterior grade deck screw. They won't streak, they won't run, they won't rust. And I can, you know, I can tighten it up or forgive it or take it down or adjust it if I have to. This little juncture right here, I worried about that since the day I drew it. And it's this the OSB is sticking out beyond the face of the brick. Over on the other corner, it's even more complicated because it's split face brick. But this is the fix that I've come up with. I've got some Z metal that will slide back behind. Let me get it back down in there so it'll go. Slide behind the corner, tuck in there. The back of that is caulked. And I'll put a trim board right over the top, capture that. And I think it'll work pretty good. Let's make sure it's plumb. So one of the things about doing this sort of thing is you're always in a hurry to get it done. And then when you look back, you think, why didn't I enjoy it just a little more? So I intend to enjoy this day, working with Secret Weapon Dave, putting siding on my daughter's shop. Let's see how it goes. One of the advantages of LP siding compared to hardy panel, you know, cement board siding, fiber cement siding like we put on the spec house, is how strong the LP is. It is OSB, oriented strand board, with a laminated face and the texture, you know, pressed onto one side. And so that strikes one as being 
sort of a low-budget solution to siting, doesn't it? And it is a much less expensive way than, for instance, redwood siding or cedar siding. And it is less than fiber cement, though not a great deal. But it is a great deal stronger, which means one guy can handle long sheets by himself, and they just won't break. I mean, they just won't break. And so you don't have to have someone carrying the other end. You don't have to be as careful as you're putting it in place. And that makes a big difference in you know, whether or not you can do this by yourself. Now, doing it by yourself introduces something that a lot of you have taken me to task for and a lot of you have not understood clearly and perhaps it's something that I have overemphasized and that is the idea that one can do everything by himself as efficiently or more efficiently than you can on a crew. Well, that's not always true. In fact, often it's not true. I believe it is true in roof stacking and I have a story that I'll share sometime that is pretty good proof of that. But in siding, you know, in most cases, you've pretty much got to have a ground man and a guy up putting it in place. These gecko holders make it possible for one guy to put it in place, but it is a real time saver, money maker, to have somebody cutting to measurements and handing it up to you. I only had that advantage for one day and then had to go back to working by myself. And I've got to tell you, Sometimes I really miss having someone helping me with projects like this. So I've come up the side until the next piece has to be fit horizontally around the top of this piece of trim. This trim, as you may have already seen, or perhaps I mentioned, is an inch and a half by about three and a quarter, matching what's on the adjacent house. This is a drip cap, I think. Not exactly a drip edge, which is tipped out, has a little tip out at the bottom so that the drips fall free. This is just a cap. It's a little roof that fits nicely. We've got inch and a half out, about three-eighths, five-sixteenths down, two inches up, so that the water that comes down here does not just immediately soak into the top of this spruce board. Now, LP siding, if I watch the right YouTube video, wants at least three-eighths of an inch of a gap between the adjacent siding and any metal flashings. So we're going to be sure to hold this up plenty. We don't caulk that gap. What we do is count on the little bit of an angle that exists in this break. We also count on nailing it at the top, making sure that there's a little bit of positive slope away from the building on this and folding just a little bit of a drop around the end. I'm not sure the drop at the end makes any difference since that's all behind the caulking coming in down that vertical line, but we do it anyhow just because if we didn't, it'd be harder to sleep at night and it's already hard enough. So I'm going to try to show this to you and just hope that the moving around on the pump jacks is compensated for by the camera. We'll see if that internal gimbal will stand up to that treatment. But I just come in from the edge of that little turn down and cut it back the same distance as that turn down. Kind of like that. Can you see that? And then I go to this inside corner and I cut it back about the same distance. A little more back here doesn't hurt. And then I'm going to cut this back so that it, the new square end originates where that cut stops. And I'm going to angle it a little bit. Like that. See what we've got? Now I'm going to take my pliers and gradually, and trying not to scratch it up, just start a break. In metalwork, a bend is called a break. Don't ask me why. So here's what we end up with.
it comes and sits right down on the end of the piece, just like that. And then if I want to, I use the trim for an anvil and gently just kind of seat it and give thanks that it's 14 feet off the ground. Now when I fasten this, I just use the same gun I've got in my hand and it's not a great system, but I'm going back over the top of this with siding and a little bump out strip and so I don't have to worry about it coming off. I just have to worry about it being nice and tight against the building with a little bit of positive slope away. So I hold up a little, put a nail in it. Come down a little ways, do the same thing, and go do the same thing on the other end of the ship. The next part of this process is to put a little sleeper. It's a little strip that is back behind the siding. No one will ever see it except the bugs that try to get in there and cannot. And it's just to maintain the same angle of bevel that we've got everywhere else. Because if we didn't, by the time we got up here and nailed it back, it would be flat. Not good. So these things are 5 16 by 3 quarter. They're going to go in about like this. And they're going to hold this projection about right. Now you guys have watched me do this, I think. I don't know if I've said anything about it, but applying this stuff means that you need to protect it from moisture because moisture is what really destroys this stuff or at least did years ago before they got their recipe figured out and they are very focused on the right gaps and the right caulking and the right you know distance between water and their product and one of the things that they insist on in order to make that a permanent condition and keep the warranty in place is to prime any cuts so i'm going to prime the bottom of this long rip I'm using this, it's an oil-based primer, which means you can go over it with an oil-based paint or a latex paint, and I hope that it satisfies their warranty requirement. It certainly satisfies my requirement for a minimum of difficulty on the job, and trust me when I tell you that this step adds as much sort of detail and sometimes frustration as any of the others. So the nailing of this stuff is fussy. You're not supposed to break the paper um, face, or at least you're not supposed to really rupture everything. But by the same token, the nail head needs to be about flush. And that one is just about right. My Hitachi does pretty good if I'm careful. This one's pretty good. It's a little proud, but we can live with that. This one is way oversunk. You know, it broke the paper. Now that's gonna be back behind the coverage of the top piece, and so it's fine. That one's good, just a little proud. That one's good. You just have to pay attention. You've already heard me complain about this when I was putting the siding on, probably. But LP requires massive gaps between the butt joints and between the siding and the doors and the windows and they just want big spaces and it looks terrible and it breaks a carpenter's heart not to be able to butt things up tight. But right now, we've got a chance to squish a couple of boxes, probably, of caulking into all the gaps in this siding that were, that were put in here very deliberately. Louisiana Pacific is adamant that you never caulk up against a flashing and you leave at least three-eighths of an inch between a top flashing and the siding. 
Well, I don't have 3 eighths of an inch here, but there's never going to be a drop of water that gets on it. So I'm comfortable with that, and I'll caulk right down the side of the window, which is much like caulking up against a flashing, but I just can't stand the thought of leaving this uncaulked on the sides. The existing house has the same detail. I'm going to go for it. One of the things that's helping us here is that any water that did get on the top of this window can't come over the end because the joint at the corner of this vinyl window stands up a little proud. So any water that does get in there is either going to sit perfectly flat or work its way out over the front. I'm counting on that. So I'm practicing this bit with this credit card. I've read about it. I've heard guys talk about it. I'm not sure it's actually making any difference, but you strike it with a credit card and you're supposed to be able to sort of telegraph the ridges of the texture of the siding onto the caulk joint so it's not so apparent from the ground. Maybe. So I showed you fellas in that video that we released, the second video about my truck, the control for the crane that I had to fix it. I had to put a new switch. These little momentary switches are great while they work, but I don't think they like the amount of amperage that has to run through them, and they just go bad. So anyway, I had to take this thing apart this morning about 3 a.m. and working at the coffee table and got it all put back together, and now we're ready to put the jib on here, reach out quite a long ways, and work up there to sort of work the pump jacks and the scaffolding together in order to get right up to the top of the world. The gable end on this is about 28 feet off the ground, and it took me a while to figure out how to get up here with a reasonable margin of safety in order to put these boards up. And then the decision was made that as long as the scaffold and the pump jacks are in place and before we move around to the south end of this thing, we're going to go ahead and paint it. And so we did. And uh, yep, I'm convinced yet again that painting is not for me. But in this particular case, as far from the ground as it is, and as thick as this latex paint is, I think the work I did will be acceptable. We're going to do it a little different on the other end, and that is we're going to have Amanda paint most of the siding on the ground before it's put up to reduce the amount of paint and the amount of time and the amount of risk associated with getting paint into all the nooks and crannies clear up under the eaves on the other end. I'm definitely on the home stretch. And I'm definitely ready to get back into my workshop and do some of the projects that have been delayed there while this shop has been being built. But I will tell you what, when I look in the rearview mirror, I just can't imagine that I had the opportunity to do something like this for my kids. It has been a gift and a blessing to be able to spend this much time in their backyard. Thanks for watching Essential Craftsman and keep up the good work.